Rob, I think we're ready for you. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. But they have believing, um, they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, and are rather, and rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the doctrine which is according to all godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strives, strivings of words. Therefore cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men, um, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of truth. Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw himself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptations and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which all some code after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, o man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickens all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which in his times he shall shew, who is the blessed and holy potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who only is, who only hath immortality, dwelling in a light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, and that they be rich in good works, ready to dispute, to distribute, with willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves good a good foundation against the time that they may lay hold on eternal life. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called, that some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Well, um, this being a letter from Paul to Timothy, um, a, uh, a minister of the gospel to a minister of the gospel. Um, verse 6 in particular stood out um, to me. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Um, 
that were great. Um, Megots. Um, I didn't look into it, but it sounds an awful lot like a word I use often enough. Mega. Um, and everywhere it was used, um, a great light, um, a great noise. Um, this is not a little thing. It is big. Um, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Um, earlier this year, in, in a time of prayer, um, something was impressed on me along these lines. I felt like um, God was asking me to do some things, and it was taking a lot of time. It led me to want to account for my day. And uh, I found myself being a bit on the discontented side of each man is allotted a day and a certain amount of time in that day. Um, after um, having worked a day, um, slept a while, eaten a few meals, um, spent some time with the family, uh, there was not much left. And so I was praying to the Lord, and I was thinking on these things, and I was wondering about the direction that um, I was going. And the Lord asked me a few questions, um, not audibly, of course, uh, but these ideas just were, they were there. And they were in my heart in such a way to where it had me asking myself good questions. And so I'm posing these questions to you. They, these are not forbidden, but... These are just the impressions that they left in my mind. If all that you have at the end of the day is me, is that enough for you? Will you give your life to prayer and to my word? Is it a little thing to you to talk to me? If all you have at the end of the day is me, are you content? If the God of the universe is all you have, are you content? There's a verse in um, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19. It says, Let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him as unto a faithful creator. To commit our souls to him. To commit our bodies to him. Our time. So I guess I would leave with Hope Church. And I think this is what Timothy was being exhorted here. And this, I'm sure this will get bore out in the rest of the sermon. Here. Be content with the image of Christ being stamped on you. chapter of this book of First Timothy, and we're going to begin by looking back at what we learned over the previous five chapters. Just in summary, in chapter one, we learned about defending the gospel against false teaching, keeping people from shipwrecking their faith. In chapter two, instructions on congregational worship and prayer, with specific instructions for men and for women. Chapter three, qualifications for elders and deacons. 
so that godly men may be selected to do God's work in the church. Chapter 4, instructions to Timothy, so that he as a pastor would be a good minister of Christ Jesus. Chapter 5, this was last week, notes on how the church must care for the needy, such as widows, and to honor the work of the church elders. And now a final chapter with instructions about specific categories of people. We're going to hear something about instructions concerning slaves, concerning the poor, concerning the rich, concerning false teachers, and concerning true ministers, beginning with something about slaves. The words uh, of the chapter 6 begin this way, all who are under the yoke of slavery. This would be a word to Christians who are slaves. And you say, well, why would they be slaves? The answer to that was, in the ancient Roman Empire, there were a lot of slaves. In fact, close to half of the people were in bondage in one form or another. Now, the slaves weren't of all the same condition. Some of them were really ones who worked like animals. It was literally under the yoke of something as if an animal. Some of them were ones who were household servants, and they did all kinds of uh, cleaning jobs in the homes, and they worked as messengers and some, so forth. Some of them were ones who you and I would think of as being professionals. They were teachers, they were medical doctors, they were other kinds of things, and they were still slaves. What made them and all these other slaves the deal was they didn't listen. They didn't have a choice about who they would work for, and they didn't have the opportunity to ever quit that employer and work for somebody else. You get this? Somebody else had authority over them. That was the economic system. By mentioning slavery, when it says all who are under the yoke of slavery and begins to give some direction about it, there have been some people who have mistakenly said, oh, I see, the Bible is condoning slavery, the Bible is affirming slavery somehow. Nothing could be further from the truth. Just earlier in this same book, in chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says in chapter 1 that among the great evils of this world is the slave trade. He's already marked that off as being something that is wicked. We understand it. But... The Bible addresses all kinds of things about what it is to live in a fallen world, in a sinful world. In just the previous chapter, the Apostle Paul addresses what people are supposed to do about being widows when their husbands die. Is the Bible condoning the death of husbands? No. The Bible is simply saying, this is something that's part of being in a fallen world, so therefore, this is how we handle it. Do you get this? So there's a fallen world, a negative sort of an economic structure that's going on, and Paul says, this is how we're going to handle this as Christians. Still in verse 1, all who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect. Why full respect? Is that because these masters have such great character? The answer is probably not. Many of them were very ungodly people. They were to be respected for the authority that they had. And that was true then, and I will point this out. Listen, this is something for all of us. The same is even more true of supervisors at your work today. Why so? Pardon me? Well, you are right. There aren't unions back then. But uh, I will tell you this. No matter what happens, listen, if you work somewhere, listen, if you work somewhere, you have a choice about whether you work there or not. Is that true? Generally speaking, that's correct. For as long as you work there, the Bible says you are to commit, conduct yourself with respect for those who are supervisors there. Do you understand this? Full respect is the words that are being given here. You are required to give full respect. That's God's command, to respond to employers with honor. Paul says in the book of Ephesians that we are to be working in our work as if we are working for Jesus Christ whether the supervisor's eyes are watching or not. If the boss is gone that day, you are working just as hard as you would be if the boss was there. Why? Because you're not ultimately working for the boss, you're working for the Lord Jesus Christ. You understand this? That's true in my work. I have very few supervisors who see how I'm doing during the course of the day, other than Jesus Christ. But it should be true of your work as well that the Lord himself is observing what is going on and that you are working in this way. He says you are, in verse 1, to be giving them full respect so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Why honor the master with full respect? Firstly, for the sake of God's name. Let me see if I can explain this. You show up at work and you say, I'm a Christian. 
and the boss says, wonderful, and you begin working in such a way where you are effective, and you work well with others, and you show respect to the boss, and soon he says, whatever it is about these Christians, if you've got another one like you, I want to hire another one. Did you understand what I just said? God's name is elevated, and people say, God changes lives. There's something cool about this. That should be the case. And not only God's name is elevated, but the gospel message begins to come through. Because if you say, Jesus changed my life, and then you're a slacker at work, I can tell you at least one boss who's not going to be interested in the gospel message now. Did you understand that? If instead you say, Jesus changed my life, and you give it your best effort, and you show honor and respect to the others who are around you, and then you share, this is what Christ did for me, you now have an employer who says, that's what Jesus did for you, tell me more about it. The gospel message, Paul's teaching, will not be slandered, will not be rejected. Now, a word comes next for all those who work for someone who is a Christian. It says, those who have believing masters, verse 2, are not to show less respect for them because they are brothers. Instead, they are to serve them even better because those who benefit from their service are believers and are here to them. Let me see if I can explain this. There's always a temptation to feel like the one who is outside the family, we have to show some respect for. Moms, dads, have you ever seen this? Your kid is willing to work pretty hard to rake the leaves for the neighbor who's giving you five dollars. It doesn't work just as hard to work for mom at home. Do you know what I'm talking about? Here it says, if the one who is the supervisor in your life is a Christian, you're not supposed to say, oh yeah, he's already in the family. He can't kick me out. Instead, you say, he's in the family. I love him even more. And what's more, the service that I perform here helps his bottom line so that he in turn can support the cause of Christ. The unbelieving master is going to be using that for who knows what, but the believing master ought to be the one who uses those proceeds for Christ's kingdom. And so it says there's all the more reason to give full support. I would say you are giving more respect for the one who is a believing master or supervisor. It says these are the things you are to teach and urge on them. These are the things that our church is to put into action where we work. Do you understand this? Listen, church. Our church is our church, whether we are assembled here, or whether we are in our various homes, or whether we are at work. I frequently go and see people in your workplace. It's not at all uncommon for me to stop by and see different ones of you there. And I want you to know that that boss there may not be called a master, and you may not be called a slave, but the principles of serving Christ in that workplace still apply. This idea of working because we're working for Christ is what became known as a work ethic. You've heard that term before, a work ethic. And it's not so much all about me and what I can be, it's that I'm here to serve Christ. And that work ethic is one which Christians had and caused some Christianized lands, including our country, have many successes. But it will not surprise you to hear that as we are turning our backs on the Lord, that we are beginning to find a measurable decline in the commitment that people have to their own work ethic. It must never be so of the Christians in our church. When I visit you at work, I believe I'm going to find you serving faithfully in that mission field where God has placed you. Do you understand this? These are words that Christians need to hear. We've heard so far about this teaching for slaves. Next, something about identifying false teaching. That's a subject that has been throughout this letter. You know that, don't you? The Apostle Paul said in chapter 1, the reason I left you as pastor of that church in Ephesus is so that you can stop the false teaching that's going on there. And all through this letter, there's some things about false teachers. We come to more of that here. If anyone, it says now in verse 3, if anyone teaches false doctrines and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, he is conceited. The word we heard in the other translation that was read is he is proud. He understands nothing. That means there's a couple of things we understand right away about these false teachers. Spiritually speaking, they are proud, they're self-focused, and also they are spiritually speaking blind and not understanding. 
And in this coming paragraph, Paul mentions three outstanding features of those who promote false doctrine. The first of them is this. It says he has an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between them and corrupt mind. These people who have this kind of a, a false teaching, I'll put up the first of the qualities they have, is they reject the historic teaching of Jesus and the apostles. If anyone teaches false doctrines, verse 3, and does not agree with the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and a godly teaching, he is conceited and so on. Anyone who doesn't agree with the sound instruction of our Lord and further rejects the good teaching they received from the apostles, See if I can map this out for us. Someone comes along today and says, historically, the church has taught this, and the Bible has believed this, and what's more, Jesus taught this, and his disciples taught this, but I see it differently. I've got something a little different here, and I want to offer you something different. You will know this is false teaching. You would say, well, why would somebody even offer teaching that is different from what Jesus had to say? As surprising as it may be to some of you, in your lifetime, you will run into people who intentionally teach things different from what Jesus said. Either because they say there's more truth than what Jesus taught, and they want to mix in other religious training. Do you understand what I'm saying? They say there's other religious teaching from other religious teachers, and if we mix it all together, we can get something more. That is an error. Or they'll say there's deeper truth than Jesus' truth. They discovered some deeper hidden meaning of something. It runs deeper, and only a few have discovered it, and they have. And I would say, you know what? If only three people in the world have discovered this unusual thing, this isn't what Jesus gave. He gave us plain teaching so that we can understand his truth. You understand that? Somebody else says, well, there's newer truth. You know, it's always evolving. It used to be this way, but it's evolving and evolving, and now there's something new that supersedes Jesus. I'd say that's error as well. There's no truth about Jesus' truth, or... Everybody's perspective isn't quite the truth. It's all just sort of a fraction of the truth and all truth. It's all that's not it either. There will be people who come to you with these false ideas about Jesus and his truth. It says, this is what is true of false teachers. Don't play along with this. Next, they promote controversies and seek to divide the body of Christ. It says here in verse 4, such a one has an unhealthy interest in controversy. That is, he wants to bring division. He quarrels about words, it says in verse 3. That is, he's going to focus on things that are not central issues. And the key word here, listen now, the key word is that he quarrels about. I want you to understand, it is normal in the Christian life for different ones to have varying interpretations about secondary matters, for them to have convictions about things, and to live by those convictions, and even just talk about those convictions with one another. That can be a very good thing. It can even be strengthening to a church to have people share what is on their hearts. But it's not the same thing as to then speak against one another based on those differences. Did you understand what I just said? Are you following me on this? If there is a some secondary or tertiary matter in the scriptures and I have a view of that, I'm glad to speak about that with anyone. But I'm never going to speak against my Christian brother who judges that matter. At that point, we're getting into the quarreling about words. And moreover, this one who is a false teacher promotes envy in verse 4. I think there's a resentment he has about somebody else's position or giftedness or influence. How come Timothy gets to lead here in the church? How come he didn't get to lead in the church? And there is envy and strife as a result. Speaking of strife, that's the next one, still in verse 4. In strife, a spirit of contention, a judgment of one another. Sometimes when a false teacher arrives in the midst of people, before long, you start to see fractured relationships and strife between this one and that one, and this group and that group. He says that's what happens when false teachers arrive. Malicious talk. I can picture that after the meeting was over, after Timothy would do some teaching, these false teachers would find a few and speak against what Timothy had just taught, criticizing the teaching, criticizing the leadership of Timothy, trying to stir unrest. Evil suspicions, verse 4. The Christian fellowship is based on trust. Firstly, trust in the Lord and also a certain degree of trust in one another. 
what I would say to the people of our church is that we frequently have events. It might be a missions trip, it might be a prayer meeting, it might be a worship time, it might be any number of things. And someone is asked to lead that event, and then we trust God to work through that. We're not really much on committees, but more than that, we're not much on factions, where these ones don't trust these ones. This comes from such false teaching. Constant friction between men of corrupt mind. The goal of these ones is ultimately division. Let me make this as clear as I can. Having, having differing opinions is common. Might be a strength for a fellowship, but generating friction and breaking down trust between Christians is sin and worthy of discipline. The Apostle Paul wrote one time saying, warn a divisive person once, and then warn him again, and after that, have nothing to do with him. This becomes something that is so damaging to the body of Christ that such a one should be put outside of the fellowship. The spirit, in the way that this translation tackles verse 4, it says he has an unhealthy interest in controversies. One commentator has said this, he says, if it's an unhealthy interest, another way of saying this is that it is sick. And worse than being sick, I think it's contagious. And then as it's contagious, it becomes deadly. Did you understand all of this? So we've seen thus far that these false teachers reject the historic teaching of Jesus and the apostles. They promote controversy and seek to divide the body of Christ. And the third thing, they often use their spiritual corruption as a path toward financial gain. It tells us here in verse 5, they've got the constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. There are cults that will sell their secrets at expensive seminars. There are people who market themselves in such a way that people are pressed to give them money with the expectation that that will lead to salvation. You cannot give any amount of money from one dime to one million dollars that will ever gain your salvation. You understand this. This is one of the things that became a flashpoint for the Reformation some 500 years ago. The wealthy church in that generation was selling salvation and selling the forgiveness of sins to people who would pay the money. And then as the money's racked in, it was being put into the building of some very grand edifices. I want you to understand that all of that is really just financial gain with no spiritual gain. You get this? Financial gain, not even for those people, but for the institution, and no spiritual gain at all. The false teachers are being identified as ones now who have at least one of these three qualities. They reject the teaching of Jesus and his apostles, they promote controversy by way of dividing the body of Christ, and they often use that spiritual corruption as a path toward financial gain. And speaking of financial gain, this becomes a natural transition to the next thing that Paul wants to comment on, and that is something about the Christian's finances, starting at verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. One translator, maybe a paraphraser I might say, tries to tie it all together in this way, saying, they think religion, these ones who are false teachers who are after financial gain, they think religion should yield dividends. And of course, religion does yield high dividends, but only to those who are content with what they have. That's interesting. There is great gain in Christ, but it isn't the kind of gain that some are preaching. It's instead gain that comes for those who are content with what they have. As I read a moment ago, God's will is for us to be content with Him. We brought nothing into the world at birth. We take nothing out of the world at death. If we have food, if we have clothing, the word for clothing can also in some contexts speak to any kind of covering, including perhaps shelter. We'll be content with that. As I look around this room, I know the lives of most of the people in this room. And I know there are differences from one life to another. But it's my impression that virtually everyone in here in this room has access to food and clothing and some shelter. 
the Bible says if you have those things, that is going to preserve your body well enough that you can do what you need to do, and that is to be spiritually seeking Christ. Because he is the one that can be enough for us. It was on to say verse 9. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap. And into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. As I read these words, almost everyone here will say, oh, that's, that's not about me. This is talking about those rich people that are going to get in a trap. I didn't say anything. He didn't say anything about him talking to rich people here. In fact, a little later he does address the rich. He says, I want to talk to those who have a desire for, a love for money. And that includes just about everyone in our society. He says all of it is a trap. And I'll tell you how this trap works. Does everybody listen? Studies show that when people are asked if they are desiring material things and they want money and so on, all of them, listen, all of them say, oh no, I'm not interested in money and so forth. That's not what I'm interested in. I just need about 20% more than I have now. Studies find that people claim that they will be content if only they have some 20% more than they have right now. If you gave them 20% more, do you know what they would do? They would need 20% more. They would spend a little more, have a few more things, and now they'll need 20% more. And so, after not very long, what will they need next? 20% more than that. And this is never ending. There never gets to a point where they say, ah, I'm finally content. Because money and its things that it buys can never bring that contentment. They always feel that it's somewhere out of reach and that they will need some 20% more than that. As I say, it's a trap. They're never happy. They always have the wrong priority. A rightful hunger for Jesus is replaced with a hunger for a little more of the world's possessions. Once they get those things, they say, I'll then serve Jesus. How many times have I had people say to me, I'm working a whole lot of overtime right now because I have all these extra bills, I'm going to take care of all these things, but once I get past this, then I'm going to serve the Lord. Rarely is that day ever come. The time to serve the Lord is now. If you wait until you get all these other things and then you can serve the Lord, it doesn't come around. And so in verse 9, there's a fall that goes deeper and deeper and deeper that's described. There's a temptation, there's a trap, there are foolish desires, there are harmful pursuits, there's plunging men into ruin, and eventually there is destruction. This love of money is described as being a root of all kinds of evil. Verse 10, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. This does not tell us that every kind of evil comes from the love of money. Not all. There are other kinds of evils. But many kinds of evil that you see flourishing above ground have at their root a false love of money. Do you get this? Most people wouldn't admit to it. But it is true. Their drive for getting more for themselves is causing them to do things that are bringing destruction in their lives. I can tell you this, there's many a Christian man who says, well, for right now, I'm going to give over my time to this overtime, and to this side income, and to these investment properties, or something else, to the neglect of the family, to the neglect of my own spiritual life. And it has eventually brought about ruin for himself or for his children or something. Do you get this? This is not my way of telling you that being involved in a second job or having an investment property or something is in itself what is evil. But as soon as somebody says, that's my focus, a little more of this. I've got these things I'm doing. I'll get, catch up with the Lord later. Jesus is being squeezed out of my life for right now because I need to take care of this. At that moment, there will be something that will be a trap and a problem. But Timothy is not going to be this one. Paul, the Apostle Paul now speaks, starting in verse 11, with a charge to Timothy. 
He says, but you, man of God, speaking of Timothy, flee from all of this. That is, flee from the false teaching, flee from the greed, flee from all of this stuff, and run instead toward righteousness. Run instead toward some qualities that are now listed as righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. In reading those, it reminds me of the list of the fruit of the Spirit. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. And I would say you cannot receive them without the filling of the Holy Spirit. Am I right? At the same time, I would say it's not a passive matter. I've known of some people who have thought if they waited long enough and wished hard enough, the Holy Spirit would fill them with these things. And I would say pray for the Holy Spirit's filling with these things. But also there is a vigorous action called for verse 12. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession. Fight the fight. Take hold of the eternal life. There are, let me put it this way. There may not be anyone more courageous. Listen. There may not be anyone more courageous than the one who stands against the spiritual direction of his age, of his surroundings and can stand against that for his whole life. Did you understand what I just said? The one who can stand against where the world is going for an entire lifetime. And continue to fight for the spread of the gospel for that whole time. This is Paul's charge to Timothy. He says, you were called to this battle when you made your confession of faith before those who originally sent you apart. You did this in the presence of many witnesses, verse 12. There was something where you claimed that you were going to serve Christ for the rest of your life. And now Paul says, in remembering that, I charge you, verse 14, and I'll back up to verse 13. He says, in the sight of God, who gives everything, and of Jesus Christ, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made his good confession, I charge you. Namely, he says, you claim, listen, you claim in front of me and others who we pray for you that you would God and that you would serve him alone for the Lord. And you did that with God as a witness, and you did that with Christ Jesus as a witness. And he's one who stood before Pontius Pilate and said, I serve God alone. Jesus was one who stood up in his generation. Timothy, you're one standing up in your generation. And now I'm going to give you this charge, this command. And the command is keep this man without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me break this down for a moment. Everyone listen to this. He says, this is something like a commission, a military commission, that you are going to keep this command without spot, that is, without any disobedience, or without any blame, that is, without any desertion from the job, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not short term for a year or two. It's for the rest of your life or until Jesus returns. Until you die or until Jesus comes back. Friends, listen. Jesus will return. We fight the fight until Jesus comes and wins the war. We don't know when that will be. It's longer than we might like. But, verse 15, God will bring it about in his own time. Somebody says, well, I don't know if God can do it. I wonder. Well, he's able, he's quite able. The Apostle Paul says that he's the blessed and only ruler. Verses 15 and 16 is the blessed and only ruler. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who alone is immortal, who lives in unapproachable light, who no one has seen or can see. May God be praised to him, be honor and might forever. Amen. After all of those words, he says, of course he can do this. Jesus will return. I think we need to let this be clearly understood. You and I need to support and build each other up. But, listen, when Paul charges Timothy to hold on to his faith and to carry this out all the way until Jesus returns, what Paul is pointing out is that nobody else can have that faith for Timothy. Timothy needs to grab on to himself. No one else can be the one who holds on to that faith or Timothy needs to hold on to that person. 
young people, you cannot have your mom and dad stay in New York. At some point, you need to say, I'm going to move on to this. So you mind. No one here can say, I'm going to have others be the ones who have to prop them up. I had people who said, well, it's all the fault of these other people. They didn't do enough to keep them on track with Jesus. I would say, I would recommend they do all they can. It is your job. It is your commission, your command to keep us in three hundred until Jesus returns. Do you understand this? <coughs> that might be a long time. For some of you who are here, it could be 70 or 80 or 90 years before we know until Jesus returns. That is your mission. It's your job. You got this? All right. <coughs> we move on now to some commands for the rich. We heard earlier. That Christians must not make an idol of wealth. They should, not, they should instead practice contentment. But many a Christian has wealth. You say, how did this happen? Some of them were born with such wealth, and some of them, by going about doing what God called them to do, were abundantly blessed by the Lord. Do you understand this? Now what? It says, command those who are rich, verse 17, in this present world, not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Here it says that those who are rich in the things of this world are not to be arrogant. Instead, they should be humble and willing to serve. Why would rich people be arrogant? Well, it can happen that people who have money start feeling like they're kind of uh, throwing money at things that people should serve them. In the world of the Christian church, that must not be. The rich man in the Christian church is the one who says, how can I help stack the chairs and run the vacuum cleaner? The rich woman in the Christian church says, how can I help visit the sick and care for the needy? Do you understand this? There is humility that does not demand, since I have money, I should be in charge around here, but instead says, how can I use the strength that I have and the resources I have to serve others? That's the attitude that is required of those who are rich. Where is the hope and security? in verse 17 is telling us it's not in our wealth, it's instead in God. And the purpose of that money is to do good, bringing glory to God through serving Him. Commanded them, verse 18, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Every dollar belongs to God. And that's true for every one of us. I'm going to tell you something, I often tell this to young people and you can hear this as well. Every dollar that God gives you belongs to Him. And if you spend it just any way you wish, you are stealing it from Him. Did you understand this? If you came to my house and there's a $20 bill lying on the kitchen counter, would you take it and put it in your pocket? Most of you would not. You would say, that's not mine. But if you had a $20 bill that you thought you earned, would you go and blow it at Starbucks? You might. Whose money is it? It is God's money. And God says that you are to have that under his control. Now I want to hasten to say, if God directly feeds you to host your friends at Starbucks and to do something near this for his kingdom, I'm in favor of it. But if instead you just say, I feel like I need to be pampered today and I'm pretty special, I'm going to go spend this money. Not only are you robbing God, but you're hurting yourself. Because what happens is that later, a year later, two years later, you say, I need to get married. I need to get a car. I want to go on this mission trip. And I, as a pastor, will say, that's wonderful. How are you going to afford this? And you'll say, I don't have any money. And I'll say, what did you do with all your money? And it all went to Starbucks here and closed there, and this there, and the electronics thing there. And it's all gone. And I would say, God gave you all the funds that was needed for what you wanted to be doing when God called you. Where did it go? God says every dollar of this belongs to him. And that's true for those who have very little and true for those who have much. We're not free to live according to our own impulses and desires. The money is for the purpose of building God's kingdom. And so, verse 18, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, that is to share, be generous, willing to share. This describes what is really God's will for all of us, that we be generous and willing to share. Virtually all of us have something to share with others. 
a great evil comes into human hearts when they're unwilling to share. You've seen this. You've seen this. It's really ugly. There's some toddlers. You have volunteered to help in a nursery care somewhere where you go and visit the little nieces and nephews, and there's toddlers, and one of them has a little thing where you can pound on it with a hammer, and you can drive the thing down and turn it over and pound on it with a hammer like this. One of them has this, and there are 27 other toys. And the fact that one of them has this, two or three others tackle the poor kid, one of them. And he holds on to it and hides somewhere and says that he's all his and he's not going to share. You've seen this, have you? I'm glad this has not happened in your home. But this is something that happens, and you say, this is an ugly thing. Here's this kid who's unwilling to share, and these other kids who are unwilling to have to with what they have, and there is something that's not right here, and you try to coach them about how they can share. Why don't you do it for a little bit? And this one can have a turn, and why don't you want to share it? This is what we do, right? That same ugly attitude, that selfish, I will not share with you, is not only what happens for little children, but it happens for those who grow up and get big, and have bigger things. And there is still a ton of willingness to share. God says, I want you to put this to that point. I want you to put this point to that point. You say, no, it's mine. And it's just like you're going to take your little toy you probably want to hide in the bed with it. And you say, no, 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 no. God says, I want you to share. Sometimes people get to the point where they say, I got it. It all belongs to the Lord. I don't want to share. And now a new paralysis sets in where you say, what? do I do about the fact that there are more needs than I know what to meet? Isn't that a problem too? You say, I'm willing to share, but there are needs, if I were willing to, I could open my mailbox and find all of these things that ask me to give money. And I could open the computer and find all of these things that ask me to give money. What do I do now? We looked at something last week, we looked at it pretty briefly from this week. It's just a Christian view of what our priorities are. This is meant to look sort of like we had set of concentric circles starting here at the center and going outward. The Lord says the very first thing we do is to be earning an income and having something to share or support those from your own family. Do that first. And do it in such a way where you're careful about how you're spending things so you have something to share. And the next circle after that, the Bible says that if there's relatives, widows, mothers and grandmothers, other relatives who are in need, you don't need to care for them next. It says, if anyone doesn't care for them, he is worse than an unbeliever. After that, it speaks of the needs of the local church. There are people within every body, every local church body, including this one, who have genuine financial needs. Sometimes you hear of those needs and share directly. Sometimes you hear about that and may want to contribute indirectly in some way. Sometimes people will bring something and say to the church elders, here is something that I want to be given to those who have unique needs. Beyond that, we then get into the world of missions. By missions, what I'm referring to is something where we have the body of Christ at work beyond the local church. The Apostle Paul would have people in their local church care for their own needs, and then they would save up for that, and they would send monies to the church in other places, and it would suffer. And then finally, there's a great world out there ranging from near neighbors to people on the other side of the planet who have needs. But the Bible would say, let's handle it in this kind of a eccentric way, where you're handling the needs of home and then the relatives and the in it, as you have more and more and more to give, we expand beyond that. You get where we're going with this stuff. Now we know where we're looking. All of this is for the kingdom of Christ. The monies and the material things are simply aids for God's greater work. There was a time when Jesus spoke of this, and he used an analogy of something that was like money. He said every one of several servants were given some money, some talents, and they were to take that out and spend it so that in the end they were investing it and building things up, and when the master came back, they would have something more to give to the master than they started. And that represented that God gives every one of us some resources we can invest for his kingdom, right? For some in this room, among those resources is your finances. God has given you enough of an abundance of that. You can say, here is a talent, here is an abundance, here is a resource that I can invest in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. In the parable, one of those guys took it and buried it and did something where he didn't invest it at all. But the person who has these means and does not invest them in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, it would be similar to burying it in the worse. 
the Bible says we want to be using whatever God has given us for the glory of his kingdom. I will say a couple more things about the rich before we're done. I will point this out. By comparison to the rest of the world, most of the people in this room are comparatively rich. As soon as somebody here says, I've been tuning out on this, you know, directions to the rich people because that's not me, I would say, well, I think twice about that. We have something to share with others for the glory of Christ. Let's keep that in mind. A few words, there's three more words used here at the end of this uh, text here. It says, in this way, verse 19, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. In this way, they will build up treasure reward for themselves. God will count this generosity and giving as worthy of heavenly reward. You're giving of stuff that you cannot keep, but perhaps the end reward that you cannot lose. Second word, foundation, verse 19. You will gain a firm foundation for the coming age meaning that as you are building Christ's kingdom, something is happening. And one thing is that real Christians can sustain such a life of giving over the course of their whole life if they are real Christians. And it will give you a platform of security by your relationship with the Lord. And finally, life itself, that they may take hold of a life that is truly life. An obedience that culminates with eternal life, is what we're talking about. And even a joy during this life, have you noticed when you're a kid, you are six or eight, Christmas is all about what you are receiving, getting. Is this true? But when you become older, and now you're a mom or a dad, something like this becomes more about what you are giving. In this world, the joy is in what we are giving. There's a life in this world. And it extends into that joy in this world. We have the last part of our message, verses 20 and 21. I'll read it and comment briefly. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed, and in so doing have wandered from the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. We come to this closing statement. It's a summary of the content of the whole letter in two sentences. Timothy, guard what's entrusted to your care. In other words, stand guard over what God has given you. He's given you, first of all, the gospel message. There are false teachers who are distorting the scriptures. Stand guard over the gospel message. Over the church, which you call the shepherd and defense. Stand guard. Over your faith, which Satan will try to damage, which others have abandoned to their own destruction. Stand guard over these things. Turn away from that which is destructive. Turn away from godless chatter. All the stuff the world is talking about. I was somewhere recently... And I was trying to talk to somebody about the Lord, and all around me, everybody was talking about frivolous things regarding football bowl games and the snacks they had at a party and whatever, whatever. Those things don't matter in the end. Turn away from the godless chapter. Turn away from false religious knowledge, and that's in quotes. In Paul's day, there were some who called themselves Gnostics who had some special knowledge, they thought. And listen, that breed of knowledge, which is false knowledge, grew and grew and grew, and that crowd got more and more powerful in the next couple hundred years. And Paul said, don't fall into that. The opportunity for false teaching and false knowledge was there in Paul's day, and in some ways has not gotten any better. Some have fallen into one of these traps of the godless chatter of false knowledge or other things. And in so doing, verse 21, have wandered from the faith. I will, we're nearly at the end. I will tell you this, guys. Everything I'm describing here is a warning to you. The most spiritually gifted people I've known, those who have all kinds of spiritual insightfulness and talent, some of those people, some of them, have 
got mixed up in sin and false things and it plunged over the cliff and it was spiritually destroyed. If you think I'm pretty strong, I'm doing okay, you are at risk. If you say, I need Jesus Christ, if the Apostle Paul has to write to Timothy and say, Timothy, hold on, watch out. If Paul has to write to Timothy about that, what do you think he needs to do to us? You are in a spiritual battle. You are in danger. You need God's help. You get this? Yep. And God is willing to give his help. The very last word says, grace be with you. And the interesting thing about grace be with you, it doesn't jump out in the English language, because we can say you meaning you kid, or we can mean you meaning you all. The grace be with you here is grace be with you all. So this letter was written to Timothy. It was to be read by the Christians there and the Christians now. And the grace and the gift, the help, the offer, the help of God is with you, all of you. He says, look, you're in a battle, you need God's help, but God's grace, God's help is available to you. Ooh, that is cool. All of you, first, find your strength and protection and your defense in God. And in some translations, the Bible, the whole text ends with amen, meaning so be it. Grace be with you, amen. And that brings us to an end of this teaching from 1 Timothy. We've gone through six chapters of that, and the Lord has blessed us in this. We all stand together.